fear can keep you prisoner. Hope can set you free. Who knows to what movie that is a tagline, or for what movie that is a tagline. Anybody? Fear can hold you prisoner. Hope can set you free. Come on, come on. Anybody? Nobody knows. Shawshank Redemption, anybody? How many have seen Shawshank Redemption? Okay, one of my favorite movies of all time, and it's going to serve as an allegory for this course. How so? Shawshank Redemption is one of those movies that is not really entertainment, uh, unless you consider horrific injustice and the terrors and horrors of jail life entertaining. I don't. But as an allegory of life and its injustices, its pains, its sorrows, its questions, and how we deal with them, this movie is not only worth watching, it's worth studying at a very deep level. I don't know how many times I've seen it, probably 20 times, and I always get something more out of this film. There are three main characters that we have to get to know to help us understand what this allegory is all about. The first is Andy Dufresne. He was sent to Shawshank Prison for a double murder he did not commit. He's an innocent man sent into a horrific world. And in this sense, he's a kind of Christ figure. Brooks is an old man who's been in prison almost his whole life. Came in as a young man, now he's elderly. He has become institutionalized. And here, institutionalization is the enemy of hope. It's the enemy of freedom. Institutionalization means you actually come to prefer the prison life to the real world, to the freedom on the outside of the prison. Another character played by Morgan Freeman, his name is Red. And Red is in the middle. Andy comes in as a witness to hope. And how does Andy witness to hope? Anybody remember the film? There are certain things that Andy does to be a witness to hope in this very dark place. He strolls. He strolls. So how is that a witness to hope? He's happy. He's, okay, he's, he's out taking a walk. There's something about him as he's strolling around the prison. They, we, the, the other guys would look at him like, what's he got that I don't got? What else would Andy do to give hope? Through his talent, uh, he ends up giving them some beer. Yeah, yeah, the beer on the, on the roof after they had tarred this, the roof, right? Yeah. And he said something about, like, I just feel like a man feels more like himself after a hard day's work if he has a bottle of suds, right? That's a beautiful, beautiful example of him breathing hope into a dark place. He also petitions the state to get funds to build a library, and he educates the prisoners. It's very, very important, educating ourselves. That's what we're doing in this course. Educating ourselves is a very important way of bringing us hope. But my favorite way Andy brings hope into this dark place, it's probably my favorite scene, not just in this movie, but any movie ever. Andy, having received some records from the state because he has this library, he locks himself in the warden's office and puts on this Mozart music and turns the PA system on over the whole prison. And these hardened criminals stop in their tracks hearing this beautiful music. And Red, remember, his character's on the fence. He's in between Andy and Brooks. Brooks was released on parole at the, really, towards the end of his life. And he found freedom so threatening that in his halfway house, what does he do? <laughs> Hangs himself. And the prisoners are trying to understand what, what was it that would lead any man to be free and then kill himself. And Red says, I get it. He says, he's become institutionalized. He says, these walls are funny. First you hate them. Then you get used to them. Then you get so you can't live without them. 
when Andy plays this music, Red, he's the narrator of the film, he says, it was as if some bird drifted into our cage and this music was so beautiful, it, it made your heart ache inside because of it. And he said, for the briefest of moments, every last man in Shawshank prison felt free. Well, the warden comes to the office and he is peeved. And he says to Andy, you turn that off, you turn that off. And Andy, he's weighing, he knows he's going to get time in solitary confinement for what he's doing. He's like, okay, here comes the punishment. But then this boldness comes over him. And when he goes, we think he's going to turn it off. He looks the warden in the eye and he cranks up the volume. And he knows he's going to get another week in the hole for doing that. And he doesn't care. Two weeks later, he comes back from time in solitary confinement. He's at the lunch table. And his buddies, his buddies say, was, was it worth it? Two weeks in the hole for that stunt? He said, ah, easiest time I ever did. I had Mozart to keep me company. And his buddy's like, easy time in the hole? There's no such thing. What, they, they let you tote the record player down there? And he says, no. I had him here. And I had him here. And his buddies are confused. He says, haven't you ever felt that way about music? Red says, well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man, but gave it up when I came in here. It's got no use for it on the inside. And Andy says, no, no, no. Here's where you need music the most. You need it so you don't forget. Red is still puzzled. He's like, forget? Well, forget that, that, that there's, there's something beyond these walls, that the world isn't made of stone, that, that there's, there's something inside that, that they can't touch, they can't get to. It's yours. And Red says, what are you talking about? He says, I'm talking about And Red says, let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. You got no use for it on the inside. You better get used to that. Anybody remember Andy's response? Like Brooks did. What do we want, my brothers and sisters? We ourselves to go with this allegory, we're in a prison. And it's very, very easy to become institutionalized, just to resign ourselves to our fate and say, there's nothing more than this and I'm just resigned to it. Later in the movie, there's a way of getting contraband into the prison, and Andy gives Red a very important gift. Anybody remember what it was? Harmonica. harmonica. He gives him a harmonica. There's this poignant scene in Red's prison cell. There's no, no you know, overdub, nobody's talking, but you can see it written all over his face. He's looking at this harmonica, and he's saying, if I blow one note into this thing, it's going to awaken something in my heart that I have spent the last 20 years trying to crush. It's going to awaken hope. Final words of the movie. Two words are Red's words saying, I hope. This course that we're going to be journeying through together, the purpose of it really is to help you discover your harmonica. To help you discover hope. What does the gospel offer us? Scripture tells us that we are saved in hope. And in a very real way, we are saved by hope. Hope of what? Here's how I'd put it. The hope that the gospel offers us is that there really is a 
banquet that corresponds to the hunger that we all feel as human beings for something. Turn on the radio and you are going to hear this cry of the heart for something. In the words of the prophet Bruce Springsteen, Everybody's got a hungry heart. Everybody's got a hungry heart. We want to talk about that. We want to get in touch with that hunger, that ache. A lot of us here have a very mistaken notion that somehow the gospel, that somehow Christ himself is the enemy of our deepest hungers, longings, and desires, and it's simply false. Turn in your study guide to page one. This is going to be our map for our journey together. All the key quotes are there. You don't need to be madly taking notes. There are margins there if you want to jot some things down, but the reason we have the study guide is so that you won't have to be madly taking notes and you can just receive the contents in a very open and relaxed way. So top of page one here, session one, is called, What Do You Want? And that's a direct quote from the words of Jesus Christ. The very first words that John the Evangelist, John the Evangelist, puts on the lips of Jesus in his gospel are these. What do you want? What are you looking for? What are you after? What are you seeking? What do you desire? The gospel is not opposed to our desires. Christ is not opposed to our desires. Christ's very goal is to awaken our desires at their deepest level. Listen to this from Pope Benedict XVI there at the top of page one. Christianity is not about suffocating the longing that dwells in the heart of man, but about freeing it so that it can reach its true height. This is the journey we're going on together in this course. Every human being is on a quest, a journey, looking for fulfillment. Where do we find it? The proposal of the gospel, as Jesus will say a few chapters later in the Gospel of John, is this. Jesus says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you're looking for me. You're looking for me. We have to have the courage as we journey together through this course to take an honest look at our deepest hungers, longings, and desires. I love etymology. I love to look up words, find their origin, what they really mean. If you look up the word desire, you'll find this Latin word, look at the second bullet there, desidere, which means in Latin, from the stars. And so the sense here is that desire comes from this longing we have, and, and we have an instinctive desire or a distinctive reaction in the desire to look up. We're like, okay, is there something out there that corresponds to the gaping hole in my heart? We look to the stars. That's the sense of the word desire. Looking to the heavens for the fulfillment, for something in hope that something will fill this void that we all have. Far from being the enemy of desire, Christianity is the religion of desire. St. Augustine puts it this way. Look at quote 1a. He says, the whole life of the good Christian. Pause. How much of the Christian life? The whole thing. So we're about to discover what the whole thing is all about. Are you ready? Here we go. The whole life of the good Christian is about squashing desire. No. Where do we get this impression? This is not our faith. The whole life of the good Christian is a holy longing. This is our life, Augustine says. 
to be trained by longing. And this means we got to get in touch with it. And this is a scary thing. This is, this is a, for a lot of us, we think it's too dangerous to get in touch with our desires. I love how Pope Francis puts it. Look at quote 1b. He says, I will ask you two questions. The first, do all of you have a desiring heart? A heart that desires. Think and answer in silence. Answer in your own heart. Do you have a heart that desires or do you have a closed heart? A heart that is asleep. A heart that is anesthetized. Let's look at that word. Again, the etymologist in me looks up words to find their origin. You know what that word anesthetized actually means? It means numb to beauty. Numb to beauty. There's beauty all around us. And the purpose of the beauty of God's creation, as we'll be unfolding in some detail, is to awaken in us a longing for infinite beauty. The purpose of the beauty in the created world is to awaken in us the hope of the satisfaction of our longing to participate in beauty. But if we are numb to beauty, we're institutionalized, we are resigned to just the ho-hum and the humdrum and okay, maybe, uh, maybe I have a little relief because I have my vacation house or I bought this new car or whatever. I'm, fi- I'm trying to fill the hunger with things that maybe they provide some semblance of satisfaction or a little relief from the struggles we have with desire and hunger. But If we're honest with ourselves, we know we're looking for something more than what this world has to offer. Can you think of a time in your own life where you encountered something so beautiful, like like those prisoners when they heard the music, that it, it just pierced your heart and made you ache inside? Maybe put a lump in your throat, maybe brought a tear to your eye. One of my favorite examples of this being pierced by beauty is from a a YouTube video that went viral some years ago. Anybody here seen the double rainbow guy? You've seen it, Father? Anybody else seen the double rainbow? I love this man. He just lets the beauty of this double rainbow that he sees pierce him. And I assure you, you, you'll, you'll vouch for me, I'm not exaggerating. He walks out of his house, he's like, oh my God. It's a, it's a double rainbow. It's a double rainbow all the way across the sky. Oh, oh, oh wow, wow. Am, am I exaggerating? No, no. He goes on and on. He starts to weep. He starts to moan and groan. And when he starts to cry, it starts to rain. It's like God is crying with him. Look it up on YouTube. Just type in double rainbow guy. And at one point, in the midst of his tears, what does it mean? See, this is the thing about beauty, when we let it in, it awakens our deepest longings and questions about the meaning of existence, the meaning of the universe, the meaning of my own life. Look how Pope Benedict XVI puts it. Look at quote 2a. Beauty, authentic beauty, unlocks the yearning of the human heart, unlocks it. The implication here is our hearts are often in prison. They're locked up. Beauty unlocks the yearning of the human heart, the profound desire to know, to love, to reach for the beyond, to reach for the stars, if we want to put it that way. If we acknowledge that beauty touches us intimately, that it wounds us. Isn't that an interesting choice of words? Beauty has the ability to wound us. That's why I call it an an ache, right? It can awaken this aching inside. It also opens our eyes. Then we rediscover the joy of seeing. The first words on the mouth of Jesus in the Gospel of John are, 
What do you want? But the second words of Jesus in the Gospel of John are these. Come, come, and become one who sees. Come, and become one who sees. It's usually translated, come and see, but it doesn't quite get to the real meaning of it. Pope Benedict XVI says, the deeper meaning, the more accurate translation is come and become one who sees. We got to cry out like the blind man in the gospel. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to see. And the more we come to see, the more we're able to grasp, as Pope Benedict says, the profound meaning of our existence. The mystery, and notice capital M, the mystery of which we are part. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I, I see something so beautiful like a sunset or a starlit night, this is how one of my students once put it, and I, I, I feel it. I know exactly what he's saying. I don't want to just see that sunset. In some way, like I want to. I want to eat it. I, I want to take it into me. C.S. Lewis says it beautifully here. Look at quote 2b. We do not want merely to see beauty. Though God knows even that is bounty enough. We want something else which we can hardly even put into words. We want to be united with the beauty we see. We want to pass into it. We want to receive it into ourselves. We want to bathe in it, become part of it. Who, who can relate to this? I, I mean, I, don't tell me I'm the only one who can relate to what C.S. Lewis is saying here. We, we want to participate in the beauty we see. What, what is a passionate kiss? What is a passionate kiss of lovers? What are they saying with their mouths? Uh, okay, yeah, I love you. That's what, but what, 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 why the mouth? What are, we, what are we actually, what is a big open mouth passionate kiss between lovers? If not, at some level, saying, I want, I, want, I want to be part of you. I want you to be part of me. And go ahead, shout it out. What did you say? I want to eat you up. I want to eat you up. <laughs> I want to eat you up. What is the, what is the mouth for? <laughs> It's for eating. <laughs> That's what lovers are saying. I want to eat you up. We want to take the beauty we encounter into us. And we know this is how we take it in. Right here. This is how we take it in. Okay, hold that thought because we'll come back to it. We got to get in touch with our hunger. The Lord says, Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. I think that's Psalm 81. Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. Here's, here's why it hurts in this life. Because at present, as C.S. Lewis says, we cannot mingle with the splendors we see. But all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. And we will eat the sun. We will eat, we will participate in the beauty we yearn for. We already do sacramentally. You should have some Eucharistic bells already like going ding a ling a ling a ling a ling. Because this is where it all goes. God wants to feed us with himself. This is our hope. This is our hope, that there is a banquet that corresponds to the hunger. This is what hope is. Look at 2C, how the Catechism puts it. The virtue of hope, it's a virtue. The virtue of hope responds to the aspiration to happiness which God has placed in the heart of everyone. It opens up our hearts in expectation of eternal beatitude. What is beatitude? It's Bliss, supreme happiness, fulfillment, to put it in a word. Hope. Hope. You are not 
crazy to believe you are made for something more. And there are moments in life where hope breaks through. Right? I, I list some of them here. 2D. Hope may break through in a song, in a sunset, in a poem, in a movie, in an unexpected act of kindness, in a good laugh, in the birth of a child, in a course like this. And when these moments come, we should drink them in. But you're only going to drink if you're thirsty. Right? What's that, uh, what's that beer commercial? Stay, stay thirsty, my friends, right? we we got to stay thirsty. Because a course like this, or, or a real study of God's plan, study of the scriptures, a Bible study, for example, it's much more about drinking than it is about thinking. Right? We're going to do some intellectual work here in this course, and that's fine and good. But the purpose of the thinking is to get us in touch with our thirst so we can start drinking. And we want to drink in hope. When these moments of hope come, we should drink them in and we should listen. If we listen, we can almost hear a voice whispering to our hearts. It's good to be here. Let's rest here for a while. Let's savor it. This little taste of hope. For it's a foretaste of what is to come. Let it lift us up. Let it fire us up. Let it give us hope. We are not crazy. My brothers and sisters, you are not crazy to believe you are made for more. You will not be unhappy if you learn how to open that ache to the one who yearns to fulfill it. I felt this hunger my whole life in a very deep way. But sadly, in my Catholic upbringing, nobody really ever connected the dots for me between this ache I felt and what I was learning in religion class, which I could summarize with one word, boring. Nobody connected the dots for me with, with the, the passion I felt when I heard a certain song on the radio or when finally in third grade, after three years of waiting, I actually got to sit next to Stacy Reed for the first time in class. The nun rearranged the room and Stacy Reed was right there and I was like, <laughs> What was that? What was that passion I felt? What was that yearning I felt? Oh my goodness, the deep brown eyes of Stacy Reed were ab absolutely captivating to me. When I was just a little, little kid, what is that? You know what it is? The church gives a name to this hunger, to this thirst, to this longing, to this attraction to the true, the good, and the beautiful. Who knows what the right word is to describe, to capture that ache? What is it? Are you ready for shocker, maybe? This is not the way we typically think of this word, but this is how the church understands the word. Eros. E-R-O-S. It's a Greek word that we often confuse with another Greek word. Porneia. What English word do we get from porneia? Pornography. What English word do we get from eros? Erotic. We think the erotic is pornographic. Whoa, time out, time out. Eros. Well, let's just go to the sources here. Look at what St. Francis de Sales says about eros. It's the third bullet there on the bottom of page two. St. Francis de Sales observed that eros is the desire in us that draws out love, that expands our heart's capacity, and that passionately rushes toward divinization. And that is a, a fancy theological word for participating in the divine nature, participating in the divine life. Eros is the yearning in us for the infinite, for the eternal. Now, obviously, we hear the word eros, or the English translation erotic, and we have sexual connotations, and we shouldn't dismiss them, because erotic longing is indeed, we experience it as a desire for union with another person. God made us this way. That's good. That's very good. But what we have to recognize is that the yearning we feel for human love 
is but a little glimmer, a little shadow of the yearning we feel for divine love, eternal love. So this is a word we're going to come back to again and again throughout our course, eros. So I want to conclude by making sure we have a proper working understanding of how we're going to be using this word. Look at the second bullet there. In its richest sense, eros is a reaching and a yearning with every fiber of our being for the fullness of life, for the fullness of love, in a word, for God. It's a yearning for the infinite. John Paul II puts it this way, 3a. The fullness of eros implies the upward impulse of the human spirit towards everything that is true, good, and beautiful, so that what is erotic also becomes true, good, and beautiful. I love it. I love that definition of eros. We'll come back to it again and again. Look at quote, turn the page, and, and look at quote 3b from Pope Francis. When eros is rightly directed, now this is the key point, rightly directed, we also have to talk about misdirected eros and how that holds out to us a certain temptation and a false promise of happiness, but it leads to despair. We'll talk about that more in the next session. But when eros is rightly directed, it becomes a pure, unadulterated affirmation revealing the marvels of which the human heart is capable. And we close with this, 3G from the Catechism. This is for us a summary of everything we want to talk about. And I'll also point out in closing that this is the first paragraph of chapter one of part one of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is what frames the whole conversation of our faith. Here it is, 3G. The desire for God is written in the human heart. It's written there. Because man is created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness he never stops searching for. That desire for God is properly called And the dignity of the human being, the Catechism says, rests above all right in this fact that we are made for communion with God. We are made for union with God. We are made to participate in the eternal, infinite truth, goodness, and beauty of God. And I close with this thought from Pope Benedict XVI. He says, a saint... And this is what I hope we all wish to be. In fact, we do. Whether we know it or not, we wish to be saints because we wish to be fulfilled. And only saints experience real fulfillment. And here's what a saint is, according to Pope Benedict XVI. A saint is someone who has had the courage to allow his or her heart to be pierced so deeply by God's truth, goodness, and beauty, that that person is transformed into a living image of God's truth, goodness, and beauty. This is the journey to fulfillment. This is the journey of the Christian life. This is the journey we're on. Amen? Amen. Amen.